Welcome to The Art of Social Media, a podcast by Social Pilot. We host in-depth discussions with world-leading social media marketing experts that will help you discover the techniques, strategies, and skills you need to use to grow your business using social media. Now, here's your host, Tejas Mehta. Is there like a model to kind of measure the ROI on influencer marketing? Because uh, for B2C, it's very clear. If there's sale, you know, that influencer is working, etc. For B2B, it can be quite tricky, right? For B2B, the sales cycles are longer. Uh, it's more of branding effort. So how do brands measure the ROI on influencer marketing for B2B? I think um, for B, it's much harder for B2B. And I think that, you know, um, you you can very very similar to me- well I mean I would say that it's hard to measure ROI for all B two B marketing, right? You know you can you can engage in a in a lead gen program, and and collect leads and and you know deliver those leads to sales and and sales can can close close it and hopefully you can reconcile that work to to prove value. It's the same with influencer marketing on the B two B side. So tracking the 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 clicks and um, you know, there's a lot of techniques and I'll just give an example. If I'm, if I'm consulting with a client and they want to do influencer marketing, usually what I'll say is, is, well, let's, let's figure out a piece of content that we can collaborate with an influencer. On. And that content could be a white paper. It could be a report and we can gate that content and, you know, and basically collect email addresses. We can also give the, the, the influencer assets to share on his or her channels and track that. So, you know, so when, when, when their audiences want to download it, we can collect email addresses. So, um, you know, that, that is, uh, to the extent as to kind of measuring the impact, you know, it depends on the back end whether or not you're reconciling a, a lead to a sale. And again, to your point, it takes, it could take 18 months before a sale is ever realized once an email address is collected. So, um, I think that the bare minimum is, tracking clicks, tracking conversions, you know, engagement rates are okay to track. I mean, it's, it's a, it's a a vanity metric, Uh, you know, it's not really showing any type of business impact. Um, But that's a start. So you start there and you, you kind of work your way down the funnel to um, then collecting leads and, and, and at some point being able to determine whether or not that those leads become sales. Interesting. So like everything in B2B, in B2B marketing, influencer marketing is a difficult not to crack in terms of measurement, but it looks like a lot of brands are more and more investing in that uh, program particularly. And that's exciting. Uh, talk to me about uh, using community as, as a medium for influencer marketing. Uh, you have thoughts on that as well. Uh, more than eager to hear that. Yeah. Well, I think that, you know, w- when I think about influencer marketing, you know, there there's a group of, there, there's there are people who look at, influencer marketing at the channel level, right? So they, they may say, I want to find the top influencers on TikTok. I want to find the top influencers on Instagram. And I think in some instances, that's okay. I like to look at influence more topically based. So I want to find the top fashion influencers, the top travel influencers, the top, you know, um, AI influencers. And then, did, you know, if, if those influencers are active on LinkedIn, and Twitter and blogs, well, our activation will be in those channels. If other influencers are active on TikTok and, and Instagram, well, then that activation will happen there. So I think, so, so when I, when I think about topically based influence, you know, um, th- that could mean everything from the topics I just mentioned to larger vertical topics like healthcare or supply chain or uh, consumer electronics. You know, and so, um, and, and all of those topics, whether they're, they're micro communities or larger communities, that's what they are. They're communities. And those communities are, exist in these different platforms in different ways. So influencer marketing, in a sense, is community marketing in a way, if you think about it. Um, you know, but I think the hard part is finding those influencers who really believe in community because some influencers are all about themselves and, and making money and clicks. And they may not, they put their interests in front of the larger community's interests. 
So I think finding those influencers that that do the opposite and you know are putting the interests of the community first before theirs, that is a win-win because once you're in with them, they are already an active participant, if not a leader in the community. Whether that community exists on Reddit, LinkedIn, it doesn't matter. They have built a community or participate in a community and they are influential within that community as well. Interesting. And uh, a lot of influencers tend to kind of uh, uh, seem to connect with their communities uh, much more authentically, it seems, as compared to uh, the Kardashians of the world. So uh, for B2B, I think that could become more effective. Good to know. Uh, you published uh, on a slightly different topic, right? You published a book in 2018 called Participation Marketing. Uh, what is that about? And what's your thoughts on uh, employee advocacy? Yeah, I mean, this was a, a topic that I was very, very passionate about early on and um, even participated in in certain programs as, uh, you know, uh, an employee. I used to work for Intel and, and we had an employee advocacy program and I was part of it. I was really proud to work there. And, uh, you know, I think employee advocacy is going to go through some shifts because the society is shifting. Uh, well, let me first say that that participation marketing was was just that it was meant to to enable employees to participate um, in industry conversations and become brand storytellers. And doing that through social media, through writing lo- long form content, and you know that was written in 2018. But you know that was like based on years of experience in participating in in, in these programs and also launching employee advocacy programs for a lot of companies. I think it's interesting now today with the shift of this generation and the idea of, of uh, quiet quitting and you know, you know, the, the clear delineation of here's who I am at work and here's who I am out of work. And if I'm not, if I don't feel like I get paid like I should, or I'm not, I don't like my manager, it's really going to be difficult to to create advocacy programs when when there's a group of employees who feel that way. Not every employee does, but I think that is a trend that I think that brands are going to have to start figuring out because you know if you don't have the culture to if you don't have a strong culture, then it doesn't make sense to have employee advocacy as a as a strategic marketing initiative. If you do have a strong culture, then it's it's a no brainer because employees are going to want to say, you know what, I love working for this company and I want to talk about it publicly. You know, let's create a program. So um I think that brands need to be careful and 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 do a self-assessment first um, on the culture. And then once that is identif- once once you realize that it's it's an opportunity, then then you go through the steps of investing in the right technology, creating a program and strategy around it, and all of that. Yeah. The shift on uh, the employer employee relationship that's been that's been drastic in the last two three years the change uh quite good quitting uh people you know quitting jobs and kind of starting as creators uh the whole market has been like uh, very disruptive so uh yeah so kind of get a self-check first before creating the market influencer marketing the employer advocacy program that sounds like a great idea uh what Going back to social media, right? Uh, what kind of content is working these days? Uh, since you are in analytics, you analyze tons of data. What do you think works the best? Well, I think from a you know from a I'll use a term that I don't really talk about much anymore, but user generated content is always performs well because it's it's authentic and it's real and it's just people, and so brands you know leveraging their audiences to to repurpose that content. Influencer content also performs well too, and so you know a lot of a lot of companies are are hiring influencers as content creators. So they're they're licensing the content or they're purchasing content for influencers because they're they understand how to create good TikTok content or Instagram content. So that is also a trend, not not necessarily on the B two B side. B two B side is a little bit different. Um, I think that creative, you know, cre- the the idea of coupling creative and 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 copy is always a best practice 
and um, and thinking about the the storytelling and the 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 lead up and the payoff of of how you are telling a story within a feed like on LinkedIn or Twitter or Instagram, you only have an image and or and that or or an asset video image and an animated GIF and then some language. I mean that is your story. So how do you you know what's the hook to get someone to stop scrolling and then what's the payoff for them to really understand your message and then like it, comment on it, click click through to it. So creative is 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 important, but then also the language you use, the hashtags you're using. You know, I I get I I I'm baffled at all these companies that are promoting content within LinkedIn and they want you to link, you know, they're trying to sell you a product or subscribe to an event or 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 white paper, yet in the post copy they put hashtags. I don't understand why they do that. Doesn't make sense to me. You know, you want to make it as easy as possible for the user to like click through and not click a hashtag. So I think that th- there, there's still a lot of learning in the space, but the creative piece of, of, of social media marketing, you're always going to need to think about, you know, hiring a strong creative person that understands how to tell stories in three seconds or less, right? Through a visual asset combined with post copy. Right. And like in the world of TikTok, right, where everybody's attention span is like shrinking, by the way, and, you know, more and more entertainment is winning over content. Is there a way for B2B brands to kind of participate in this TikTok wave, uh, create more entertaining content and kind of post it on LinkedIn? Uh, is that happening? Is that what you see? Yeah, it's happening. I, it, it is. And it's, um, well, I haven't seen a lot of brands do it, but I have seen, you know, they're, they're, the audience is there. Uh, for example, I, I went to TikTok and I did a search for DevOps, which is a, as a, as a B2B term for yeah. that developers are using uh, to, to manage the operations of the development software lifecycle. And, um, you know, so if you work in B2B or tech, you, you know what DevOps is. But there's a huge community of people on social media that talk about it. And also, I mean, if you look it up on YouTube, that, just look up the hashtag or on Instagram. And uh, TikTok, I mean, there's a lot of users who are writing about and, and provide, creating content rather about DevOps. So the audience is there. It's just a matter of brands trying to figure out like what's the best way for us to create content and engage with this community that doesn't feel so corporate or in your face marketing. And that's the hard part because they can't, it's not like they're going to publish a white paper, right? They, they need to show a different level of, of a tone of voice in these channels. And I, I don't know if all B2B brands are yet comfortable with that. Right. And that's where I think the creative aspect comes in, right? Getting like the right creative, or maybe as you mentioned, collaborating with an influencer or a creator and kind of having them create this content for you. So uh, that might be like a great opportunity. Yeah. Wonderful. Uh, what do you think is the future of social media? Uh, what is metaverse and what does that do to social media? I think the metaverse is, um, you know, it's an interesting opportunity for brands to um, to really think out of the box with how they are building community and, and selling products and engaging with consumers and um, writing press releases. I mean, whatever whatever you do today, you can do differently within the metaverse. And I think the metaverse in general is still de- being defined, right? There's There's... There's the metaverse, and then there's these small metaverses, right? That that the different companies are and are creating, and uh, so I think that that social media um, is going to change, you know, uh, from a from a brand standpoint, you know, how you structure your marketing teams is going to change, um, the skill set needed to hire to for, for marketing is, is, is will change, but I don't think it's going to happen overnight. It, it's still it's still changing. And I think that, um, you know, social media is, you know, going to become, it's always been visual. It's going to become even more visual um, as it relates to, you know, AR and VR and, you know, the way that people are, the way that there's the exchange of, of, of products and services and goods through NFTs and cryptocurrency and things like that. All that is, 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 is changing daily almost. But I think the core, uh, the core, kind of idea around social media and it being a community of people isn't going to change. It's it's just going to be 
you know, the, the community on the metaverse is just going to be different, right? There's still going to be shared interests and shared values and shared ideas, but the way those are being articulated and communicated and and visualized are just going to be different. It's going to be in, in you know, I'm going to wear my headset and I'm going to be seeing people's avatars and things like that. So um, community is not going to change and and uh, it's just the, the, the medium is going to change and, and the, the advertising, right? There's a new opportunity even for, for new advertising um, within the metaverse, right? You know, maybe you sponsor a lounge or you are creating, you know, uh, you know a world around a topic and... I don't know, you, you, you know, you, you have ads everywhere or people, I don't know. There's a lot of different things to do with the metaverse and I'm excited about it. Um, and yeah, I can't, I can't wait to see where the technology goes. Right. And how is the analytics going to change uh, in metaverse? That That's going to be a different ball game altogether. hundred percent. Yeah. I, I honestly don't really know. I, you know, uh, you know, there, there's some worlds that you can participate in do have some metrics around, activity you know how active are people in the world what are the what actions are they taking so so that'll happen i think when, once it once it right now the people participating in the metaverse it's the one percent it's the it's the early adopters it's the tech enthusiasts your everyday consumer isn't there yet once they get there and as they get there i think that there'll be analytics platforms and you know technology innovation that will allow you to kind of think through new uh, you know, KPIs and, and metrics to pull that can show some level of value with, uh, with, with brands and, and their participation in it. But um, I, I don't really know if I can answer that question. You know, there's, um, I think it's still unknown and I'm excited to kind of like learn. And um, as, 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 as we kind of progress as a society, um, there's going to be a ton of new innovation that we can continue to learn from. Right. Uh, what are your thoughts on NFTs? Uh, is it a re- real utility for NFTs, or is it just like a fad? <laughs> I think the NFTs. Are, I think the 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 idea of selling digital art is a fa- is a fa- is the beginning is the first step into this new commerce. I think the 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 NFT transaction and the technology behind the transaction is the future of commerce online. So. Um, the, the, whether it's digital art or real p- products is a, is you know the transaction is is going to be the facilitator of that. So NFTs, it's I don't know if it's a fad or not, but it's it's just the the, the entry level steps into this new di- I, this idea of it, of purchasing goods and services and the exchange of 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 of, of money, if you will, in different forms uh, on 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 these different platforms. So that is going to really innovate the way that you know concerts happen and tickets are sold and venues are attended um but it's not i mean digital art it's it's just a thing you know i think there are some brands that are doing some cool stuff around it um but that's just the first step there's going to be so much more in the future right that'll be exciting to uh wait and watch good to know uh michael you also consult a lot of companies in their digital marketing efforts you kind of help them uh get their marketing efforts together and create impactful stories. Uh, what are some of the uh, best ideas that you have had and you kind of, you know, had them implemented, uh, like top three ideas that you think could, people should copy? Well, well, I don't know if I have three ideas. I'll give you one idea. I think it was, it was interesting. This couple of years, I was about a year ago, you know, right when the, actually when the, the, the pandemic first started, um, one of our clients, um, they have a, a customer event and uh, we, you know, they wanted some ideas on on different ways to engage with the attendees. And the customer event was 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 going to happen in this this really traditional environment where you kind of log in, and you know, and you you can at- attend a session and you can chat. It was closed. It was closed off. Like you had to like be a part of the event to participate. And. You know, we had suggested them to launch a Twitch, a, a Twitch account, and a Twitch, basically a Twitch pro, launch a Twitch profile, and stream some of their events um, publicly on Twitch, and have like what we called an after party um, on Twitch. So, after a particular keynote event would happen, 
we would, you know, everybody would go to Twitch and, and talk about it because you really couldn't do that in the existing platform. And, you know, at the time, I mean, this was just two and a half, three years ago. I mean, Twitch was looked at as, and I think it's overcome this early perception. It was looked at early on though, years ago, that it was just a, a place for gamers, uh, yeah. for us to watch people play games. Um, but, you know, there's a lot, there's a lot of podcasts. There's a lot of production value on Twitch, DJ, you name it, they're there. And um, they were very successful at, at using this new platform to engage with this user base. And they're still there. It's, it's thriving. It's alive and well. So I think that the key takeaway is like, it's a, we had permission by the client to try something new. And if we fail, no big deal. We will learn from it. So it's hard to find clients that are like that. And if you do, and they're willing to give you the license to, to fail, you know, then having these like unexpected activations, like, like, you know, a Twitch stream for a very deep tech company was amazing. And we were, and, and it was, and it works and it's still very effective. So that's, I think the one, one example that I think is that I can, I can talk about without wasting five minutes trying to look at some old emails. <laughs> yeah, no, this is exciting, right? Uh, Who would have thought? You know, doing an event on Twitch would turn out to be successful. So that's that's wonderful. Uh, who are some of the uh, brands or influences for marketing or social media marketing that you follow? Uh, who are some of the people that I should be following as well? I think that um, well, I can I can say that on on the tech side, you know, there's there's um, Sarbjeet Johal who who is um, you know he's he's based here in Silicon Valley. And he, I mean, he's a, an engineer by trade. Like he was an engineer, he led development teams and he is now kind of this, he's like an analyst in a way. And he's, you know, um, really built, he's become very influential. And, and because he's an engineer, he understands the technology that's driving Silicon Valley innovation, you know, AI, machine learning, NLP. And, and so he's somebody that, that I, I like to follow because he's, you know, he doesn't consider himself an influencer, right? He, he's more of a thought leader and he's very influential. Um, those are the type of people that I like to follow because they're, they're producing thought provoking content. And, um, you know, they're just not a great photographer taking a picture of uh, themselves, you know, as an example. Um, that, that is one person that I think is, is good. And then I think there are other, uh, you know, let me just think. I can't, I can't even, I, I wish I would have wrote those down. I, he, he's someone, if I had to pick one person and you work in B2B tech, follow him. Um, he's very insightful, very nice guy. And, um, and he's, you know, he produces really, really good and thoughtful, thoughtful and insightful content. Wonderful. Where can people find you online? Yeah. Well, um, my, my, my Twitter ha handle <laughs> is Britopian. It's B-R-I-T-O-P-I-A-N. I also have my website, Britopian.com. I do a lot of writing there. I do a lot of analysis on there as well. Um, Twitter, LinkedIn are, are the two channels that I typically use the most. Um, and, uh, and yeah, I, I like to connect and, and talk with others and uh, debate. And, you know, I, I get criticized and I criticize people or not people, but content ideas. Um, cause I like to, I like to be, provo I like the, that provoked content and conversation. So, uh, if you don't agree with what I say, I'm glad let's talk about it. You know, let's talk about why and, and, and I've been proven wrong before and I'm, uh, you know, and I like to be proven wrong. So, um, yeah, that's where you can find me. And, uh, and thank you so much for this time. And it really was a pleasure in talking with you. Absolutely. I have tons of questions again, uh, but we'll, we'll have to kind of call you in a second episode and kind of do that. Uh, this is, this has been really exciting. Thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate it. Thank you. The Art of Social Media is brought to you by Social Pilot. To find out more about Social Pilot and how we can give you everything you need to hit your social media marketing goals, visit socialpilot.co. And then make sure to search for The Art of Social Media in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Google Podcasts, or anywhere else podcasts are found. Make sure to click follow so you don't miss any future episodes. On behalf of the team here at Social Pilot, thanks for listening.